For the maintenance of snails, we place the snails in the tray that can be shown in the picture and we fill the tray with a little bit of water and we place food such as carrots, cucumbers and cabbages. For why we place water is because the snail's body shouldn't dry up as their body is slimy so and without water uh, it can dry up so that's why we don't we do add water after the snail is done feeding i place these snails in the basket the basket and the lid which is this part they are together and they are not separate after they are done feeding i place them in the basket and i slightly fill the basket with water so that these snails body do not dry up and I close the basket so that these snails do not escape while I'm not watching them. And that's it. Giant African snails eat a variety of things which includes leaves, fruits, vegetables, tissues, paper and organic matter in the soil. According to the design of our experiment, we feed the snails with coriander and cucumber. Each snail is provided about 4 to 5 leaves of coriander in a time interval of 24 hours. Cucumber slices of moderate size can also be provided to the snails. The food is kept in petri dish which is then kept inside the container in which the snails are kept. In addition to that, chalk powder is provided once in a week as a calcium supplement. Every day, the leftover food is Olfactory assay. Why to perform olfactory assay? Olfactory assay is done to observe the olfactory ability. Olfaction is defined as the detection of environmental chemicals present. Olfaction is the sensory principle. Therefore, olfaction is done to see the behavioral change in the snails after we provide it with the coriander for a period of time. We feed the snail with coriander and starve it for 24 hours before the assay. Tank should be covered with the black paper but we should not cover the one part of the tank because we need to observe where the snail is moving. Why to perform control versus control assay? Because we need to calibrate the instrument, that is, we need to check whether there is any odor or smell of any molecule in our setup, that is, the olfactometer. Steps to perform control versus control assay. First, take blank white paper, then draw a circle of diameter 10 cm and a radius of 5 cm. Second, then draw a perpendicular line in between the circle, then mark the direction, that is the north and south pole, and C1 and C2 at the either side of the perpendicular line on the circle. Third, then place a glass slide on the paper and with the help of the dropper, put a drop of distilled water on C1 and C2 point. Fourth, then place the snail at the north direction and then cover the slide with the tank. As soon as we cover the slide with the tank, we should set a timer. Fifth, like this we should take 20 readings and for the rest of the readings, the snail should be kept alternatively. Like for the first reading at north direction, then for the second reading south direction uh, and so on. And after all the readings have done, we need to calculate the ORI, that is olfactory response index. The formula for ORI is C1 minus C2 upon C1 plus C2. Then we perform olfactory assay with sample that is the coriander juice and the distilled water. The procedure is same as that of the distilled water versus distilled water, only we put in C1 side distilled water and C2 side coriander juice. We observe that the snails move most of the times towards the coriander juice that is the C2 side that is out of the 20 readings almost 17 to 18 read, uh, times the snail go, moves towards the uh, coriander juice that the this is eric candle and he studied nervous system in, in sea slug his breakthrough came in 1970 
and he was subsequently rewarded the Nobel Prize in 2000. So I'll be talking about Eric Kandel's experiment and what his experiment basically was that it was based on learning and memory wherein he made the slug to not react to its touches or habit or in simple words habituated the slug and then he resensitized it by giving a small shock to its gills so its defensive systems are reactivated and it is resensitized. So I recreate the same experiment with my snails. So you might ask why I'm using my snails. So the reason why I'm using my snails is because the tentacles are uh, somewhat similar to the gills that are shown in Eric Handel's experiment, uh, the gills of the sea, uh, sea slugs. And the sea slugs gills and uh, my Acatina filica's tentacles, they both withdraw or uh, retract on stimulus. So I'll be talking about my air candles experiment recreated with my snails. So as you can see in this, I touch one tentacle and both of them retract. Both of the tentacles retract. This is um, normal because if someone tries to touch your uh, touch your left eyes, you will naturally um, re retract or I'm um, sorry, not retract. Um, you'll close both of your eyes. So this is natural. And later on, when the tentacles start to come up again, it is to be noted that the tentacle that I've touched has come a little later than the tentacle that I have not touched. In this part, I touch the left tentacle which was previously touched and instead of both of them retracting, only the left one retracts fully while the right one has been shown stable. Again, the left tentacle is retracting fully while the right one is unfazed. And in this, in this one, I touch the right tentacle, and and it looks like the right tentacle does not, uh, um, the right tentacle contracts while the left tentacle does not contract. And now I resensitize the snail by giving it a strong stimulus so that it forgets the habituation that had been learned earlier by the snail. So you can see it from now onwards. Here I give a strong stimulus. It makes both of the tentacles retract. And now when I touch one tentacle, both of the tentacles withdraw. Hello everyone, I am Feroz Patel from Makerspace, collaborating with Cube Snail Group. In this video, we can do a simple exercise in which we can control a motor with a sensor. Here, this sensor is a sensory nerve in the siphon of the snail and the motor is the muscles of the gills. And Arduino is the internervous of the snail. So let's do it. When I move paper closer to the sensor, motor starts or muscles start moving. When I remove the paper, the muscle stops moving. Let's do it one more time. When I put it, it starts moving. Remove, stops. Let's do it for more time. Let's put the paper for more time. After some time passes away, the snail habitual of the touch. 
so the muscle stops moving or motor stops rotating. That's all for this video. Thank you. Why this sudden reaction? Reflex arc is a neurological and sensory mechanism that controls a reflex action. The receptors on the hand skin receives a stimulus and then transfers the stimulus all the way to spinal cord through a sensory neuron. There Another relay neuron passes the signal to the motor neuron. The motor neuron transfers the signal to the effector muscle and the muscle contracts. Abnormal learning and memory retention abilities can lead to several diseases in humans. One such disorder which is linked to learning and memory is Alzheimer's disease. What we learn is stored in specific areas of the neurons called the synapses, which are the areas between two neurons where they communicate and information is passed in the brain. Sometimes in the brain there is accumulation of beta amyloid proteins which are released along with neurotransmitters. These beta amyloid proteins accumulate and block the synapses which makes the person unable to remember things and difficulty in carrying out day-to-day -day functions. Other hypothesis is that the tau protein which is responsible for holding the microtubules begin to pair with other tau proteins. As a result, the microtubules disintegrate and tangles are formed inside the neuron. This can result in the malfunction or death of the neuron. This leads to the shrinkage of the brain. Hello doctor, thank you for taking off time from your busy schedule. Say, how can I help you? I need to submit a project on Parkinson's disease and I don't know what a person goes through in this disease. Can you tell me about it? I can try narrating a story of one of my patients so that you get a broader view of how what a person goes through in Parkinson's disease. He had become a lizard. A great lizard, frozen in dark, cold, strange world. His name was Robert. He was a tall, thin man in his 60s. But like most patients with Parkinson's disease, he appeared to be much older than his actual age. Not many years ago, he has been active, vigorous businessman. Then it happened, not at all at once, not suddenly, but slowly. Now he turned like a piece of granite, walked in slow, shuffling steps and spoke in a monotonous whisper. What has been his symptoms? A tremor. Had his tumor been disabling? No, his hand tremored the worse when they were doing nothing at all. A symptom called tremor at rest. The other symptoms of Parkinson's disease are not quite so benign. They can change a vigorous man into a lizard. This includes rigid muscles, a marked poverty of spontaneous movement, difficult in starting to move, and slowness in executing voluntary movements once they have been initiated. The term reptilian stare is often used to describe this characteristic, lack of blinking and the widely opened eyes gazing out of a motionless face a set of features that seem more reptilian than human. Truly a lizard in the eyes of the world. A small group of nerve cells called as substantia nigra, black substance, were uncountably dying. These neurons make a particular chemical called dopamine, which they deliver to another part of the brain known as striatum. As the self of the substantia nigra die, the amount of dopamine they can deliver goes down. The striatum helps control movement and to do that normally it needs dopamine. Thank you for the explanation doctor. Happy to help. Bye.